My name is Gina Brown, and I am one of the deans in the Educational and Support Division at the California Community College's Chancellor's Office, where my primary responsibility is the student financial aid programs. But I also serve as the Chancellor's Office Liaison to the SSCCC. So again, I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, I could talk for hours about financial aid, right? Because there's just so much to know. So what I'm going to give you here is an overview. But I also have, I don't know if you were able to access it, but I also put all of this in a um, handout and I'll share it in the chat right now. That way you'll have access to it. And then it will also be available afterwards as well. So let me see if I can get that going. And this might help the closed captioner as well because it's pretty much gonna follow um, what I've got written in there as well. Um, again, if there's plenty of time for questions, but if you, get, if you have a question that occurs to you when we're done, by all means, you can send me an email and I'm gonna start sharing my screen now. And that will have my email address on it. So you can feel free to use that at any time. Um, again, if you have questions, put them in the chat. I'll try to pause here and there to um, make see if we have any questions. But there's just a few of us, so we're going to kind of just have a conversation um, and go from there. So I'm just going to jump right on in. Okay. Let's start with a little bit of trivia. All right. Who thinks they know how much financial aid was processed and funneled through all the California community colleges during the fight? Um, during the academic year of 2019-20. We're looking at $10 trillion, $1.8 billion, $2.9 billion, or none of the above. Anybody have any guesses? You don't have to share it. Just in your mind, just think about how much financial aid do you think was processed over 1920? I'll tell you, it was actually $3,896,695,804. It's $3 billion. And I know it seems like a lot of money, and it is. But the fact of the matter is, it's not enough, right? There are countless research papers, studies, and publications that tell us that students need more financial aid to not only help them meet the cost of getting a college education, but to meet their basic housing and food needs. We know that California college students who receive financial aid are more likely to graduate and enter the workforce or transfer to a four-year university in less time and with fewer accumulated units than those students that do not get financial aid. The good news is more financial aid is available and it's available year round. And there is no bad news, there's only work to be done. I did want to go back a slide or two. I kind of skipped over this one. It's a pretty important slide. It's the vision for success goals and commitments. I'm sure many of you have seen this slide. Basically, it's got our vision for success goals on the left and then our commitments to both not only to students, but to our colleges to make sure that students are able to achieve their educational outcomes. Financial aid will help achieve all of the goals of the vision for success. There's no question about it. Without financial aid, so many students would not be able to go to school. And that's why this information is so important. So like I said, I do have a bunch of slides to share with you today. It's a lot of information and it's all in that handout. You know, financial aid has a reputation of being super complicated and not worth the trouble. But I'm here to tell you it is, okay? It can be complicated, but it's not hard. Okay? Um, and out of everything that I say today, everything, there's only one thing I really need you to take to heart and to remember, and that is you have to apply for financial aid every year. Okay? That's not all you have to do, but that is the absolute first step. Because without that step, the rest of what I'm about to say means absolutely nothing. So if you, if you only remember one thing today, that is do not count yourself out and apply for financial aid every year. Many students, I'm sure there's some of you could are first generation college students, and this may be their first year where they've had any exposure to applying for financial aid. And again, the information I present, it's not gonna make you an expert, right? But it's definitely a good start. And whether you know it or not, just by virtue of you being here, 
You are a student leader, and with that comes the responsibility of sharing what you know about financial aid with your friends, your family, other students that need the information. So let's go ahead and get started. On this slide, I've put together the total picture of financial aid. So we've got $3 billion that was dispersed in 1920, and you'll see the vast majority of that, it's about 60%, came from federal financial aid resources. We've got the yellow wedge is our Cal Grant resources. This light blue color um, belongs to the Chancellor's Office programs. And then this gray color is the other programs. So included in the federal portion of the pie we've got there, we've got, everyone should know about Pell Grant. There's federal work study. There's the Federal Supplemental Educational Opportunity Grant, also known as FSEOG, and of course, their direct loans. And these programs made up about 60% of that 3 billion or about 1.8 billion. For all forms of federal financial aid, students must complete a FAFSA annually. And then for all forms of financial aid, students must meet the Title IV eligibility requirements. Those requirements are listed here. I'm not going to read them all to you, but this is for federal financial aid. So students must be a US citizen or an eligible non-citizen and have a valid social security number. One other um, requirement I just want to point out here is that males between the ages of 18 and 25 are required to register with Selective Service. I, this is going away in a couple of years, but until then, if you were assigned male at birth, then you are required to register for selective service in order to receive federal financial aid. And again, these requirements are listed in the handout. If you don't have it, we'll make it available for you as well. So I'm gonna pause there for just a second. I, I, while I'm sharing my screen, I can't see the chat. So I don't know, do we have any questions so far? Or does anyone have any questions that you can unmute yourself and just speak out loud? Okay, cool, I'm gonna keep going then. So then I'm gonna talk about the Pell Grant. So the Pell Grant is the biggest form of financial aid um, that California community colleges, college students receive. For the 21-22 school year, that's the award year coming up, the maximum award amount is $6,495. For this current year we're in now, that's $300 higher because this year it's $6,195. Students may receive the Pell Grant for an equivalent of six full-time years. So if you're going part-time, of course, that's extended out. Pell Grant can be used at any co eligible college or university. It's available year round, meaning there's no real deadline for you to apply. And it is only for undergraduate students. Next, we have the FSEOG. This one is a smaller grant, but it can range anywhere between $104,000 and and the amount varies by the college because it all depends on how much the college receives. And priority for this type of grant is giving to the students, the lowest income students with the highest need will receive a FSEOG grant. So then we go to the next one, work study. Most people have heard of work study, right? It's basically, it provides a job on or off campus, depending on the, camp the campus, of course, for students with financial need. The amount varies by college. It's only accessible through the FAFSA and students have to be paid at least minimum wage and it is subject to tax withholding. And then we've got our um, direct loans. So direct loans, as the name implies, must be repaid. Regardless of whether you finish your classes, if you drop out of classes, you switch majors, whatever the case may be, the direct loans must be repaid. There are two types of loans, direct loans. We've got subsidized loans where the government pays the interest while you're enrolled at least half time and during a six month grace period. There's unsubsidized direct loans and that's interest that begins to accrue as soon as the loan is dispersed to you. Now the, loan, the, the interest begins to accrue but you don't have to start paying until after a six month grace period. And then there are um, education level and lifetime limits apply. For example, a freshman cannot borrow the same amount as a senior, as that's what we mean by the education level. 
in the link, I have a couple of, um, excuse me, in the handout, I did provide live links for you. And these are links to the Federal Student Aid website where you can get additional information. I did wanna take a moment though to focus on student loans because there's been just, if you turn on the news, it seems like every other day there's Congress is talking about um, having loan forgiveness, wiping out all the student debt. I hope they do. I'm still paying on my student loans, almost done, but I still got a ways to go. But it's really important that students borrow wisely. Okay, students, you, you never, you only wanna borrow the amount that you need, right? You don't wanna take out loans just to kind of make life luxurious, right? Because again, these loans have to be paid back. And there's a difference between unsubsidized and subsidized loans. And that's kind of what I put on this screen here. But then there's also a thing um, called private loans, or alternative loans. These are usually loans that students get directly from a bank. Um, those, they usually have a higher interest rate. They don't have the same repayment flexibilities. You see a lot of students at private universities taking out alternative or private loans. I mean, there are a few community college students who do as well, but you just really want to think about if you're thinking about a loan to just really think about how much you're going to borrow and then just thinking about how you're going to pay that back eventually, okay, knowing that it has to be paid back. Number two thing I want you to remember if you, you know, you have to remember to apply. Number two, if you take out loans, please borrow wisely. I cannot stress that enough. I want to pause here to see if there are any questions in the chat. Do we have anything? Okay, I'm going to keep going. So I talked about our federal forms of financial aid. So we also have state funded financial aid. And those financial aid programs are mostly administered through the California Student Aid Commission and show up in the form of Cal Grants. And then there's some other state aid, I'll talk about those in a second. So Cal Grant comes in Cal Grant A, B, or C and our transfer entitlement. Cal Grants are available for a maximum of four years, full-time equivalent. And then there are entitlement and competitive awards. Now it's the Cal Grant that gives financial aid their complicated reputation. It's pretty complicated. Um, there is some Cal Grant reform uh, pending legislation and I'll get to that in just a moment as well. So I didn't put it on, on the slideshow, but it, it's, in your, it's in the handout, the Cal Grant eligibility requirements. You'll see that they're practically the same as the federal uh, financial aid requirements. The only difference is that undocumented students or students who meet the AB 540 criteria are eligible for Cal Grants, right? So they just have to fill out the DREAM Act application and then they can have access to the Cal Grants as well. But you see the, the, the other requirements are all the same. That selective service is still an element. Um, so I just wanna make sure that you see that. And again, it's in the handout. So let's, let's talk about Cal Grants just for a second. We've got Cal Grant A here, um, which is the deadline is March 2nd, right? You have to have a high school um, GPA of 3.0. And it pretty much what Cal Grant A does for the UC and the CSU, it pays the system-wide tuition at the CSU and UC, which is why Cal Grant A is not available for community college students. However, if a community college student is awarded a Cal Grant A, that Cal Grant is put on hold or held in reserve until the student reaches the four-year university. Cal Grant B, on the other hand, um, requires a 2.0 GPA, and it's a little lower um, income to qualify as well. Community college students can receive a Cal Grant B, and if you do, you're entitled to the $1,672 per year, and that's at full time. And then if you transfer to university, you take that with you, you get that 1672 plus the tuition if you go to a university while you're receiving a Cal Grant B. Both Cal Grant A and Cal Grant B do have a March 2nd deadline. So if, and then there is, there is a, a one more chance if you miss that March 2nd deadline. We've got Cal Grant C, which is, 
there's no deadline. Cal Grant C is more for students who are taking um, CTE or career technical education classes. Maybe they're going for a certificate um, or an associate of science degree. And so for those students that they are eligible for $1,094 while attending a community college. There's one other type of Cal Grant I wanna talk about and that's the Cal Grant Community College Transfer Entitlement Award. Okay. These awards are for students who graduated from a California high school who did not receive a Cal Grant before they're getting ready to transfer but have at least a 2.4 community college GPA and plan to transfer to a four-year university. The thing about the transfer entitlement awards are eligible students must be under the age of 28 um, and be pursuing a bachelor's degree. That's the university portion. And entitlement awards can either be Cal Grant A or Cal Grant B, depending on the household size and income. Transfer entitlement award does have a March 2nd deadline. Even, so for example, if you plan to transfer to the university in the fall of 21, you would have needed to apply by March 2nd. And that goes for as well, if you were planning to transfer in the spring of 22, right? you still would have needed to apply by March 2nd of, the, um, of this year. So one thing, one more thing about Cal Grant is that if you miss that March 2nd deadline, many people do, it happens for lots of reasons. There's one more opportunity for community college students to apply for a Cal Grant and that's called the Cal Grant Competitive Award. And it's a limited number of Cal Grants that are available for students who weren't eligible to be considered previously or missed that deadline. Eligible students must still meet all the eligibility requirements, have the same financial need. And um, therefore students who may be, who aren't recent high school graduates or older students are eligible for the competitive awards. It kind of priorit prioritizes our non-traditional students. So I do have, then um, that's the September 2nd deadline. I did put a, a link into the, um, in the handout to stick the California Student Aid Commission website. They've got so much information on there. It's really great. It's geared towards students. It's easy to navigate their website. So I really encourage you to take a look at the California Student Aid Commission website. Okay, moving on, pausing again to see if Victor, are there any questions in there for me right now? Again, hearing and seeing none, we're gonna keep on going. So the next source of financial aid is still another state source, but these are financial aid programs that are administered through the Community College Chancellor's Office on behalf of the Board of Governors. We've got three financial aid programs that my staff and I oversee. We've got the California College Promise Grant or CCPG, the Student Success Completion Grant, SSCG, and the California College Promise, sometimes it's referred to as AB19 dollars. Now this, these three programs make up 28% of that $3 billion in financial aid that was given out. That's about $871 million. So the first one I wanna talk about is the California College Promise Grant. People refer to it as the fee waiver. It used to be called the BOG fee waiver. They just made it, gave it a more modern, a more modern name, basically. What it does is that it pays the $46 per unit enrollment fees. It doesn't cover the health fees or any parking fees, but you may receive a discount on your parking, depends on what the college is offering. Students do have to maintain a certain level of academic progress in order to remain eligible for the Promise Grant. That is a 2.0 GPA, and you have to complete at least 50% of your coursework every, and that's a cumulative. So the college is gonna to check to make sure that you're completing at least 50% of your courses. The other programs we have are the Student Success Completion Grant. And these are grants that are eligible, or excuse me, available for Cal Grant B and C recipients who are enrolled in at least 12 units. The idea behind this grant was we know the Cal Grant amount is so low, it's only $1,600. And so I think legislature said we need to get more help to our community college students who are Cal Grant recipients. So you see here, if you're taking 12 to 14.9 units, you get 649 per semester. 
and 15 or more goes all the way up to $2,000 per semester. The last form of financial aid programs that the Chancellor's Office administers is the California College Promise Program. Although it sounds like the California College Promise Grant, they're definitely very different, right? This one is, was uh, put into law by AB 19. This is the way a lot of people refer to it to differentiate between the two programs. But this is the program where colleges may use the funding they receive to waive tuition for two years for first time full time students that are not eligible for the fee waiver. Some colleges are also using their funds to give grants to students who are not first time and full time and they're able to do that. They just cannot give them a fee waiver or pay their tuition, but they can give them grants that could help them with books, fees, other academic, they have other academic services, counseling, career counseling, all kinds of things that student uh, colleges are using their AB 19 dollars for. Again, the programs do vary by college. So if you're interested, um, most colleges, I looked at just about all 115, they all have some sort of link that describes their promise um, program. And then I just wanna spend a few minutes on our little other sliver here. So 5% of that 3 billion, or it's about 142 million, um, is made up of scholarships. We've got the Chafee Grant for foster youth, institutional grants and private loans. So let me just talk about those for a second here. So the Chafee Grant is a grant that is designed for, is available to former foster youth. And what it does is, oh, it provides, oh, that's the wrong slide. It's, that's the work study slide. <laughs> I'm a little embarrassed. Um, basically, the Chafee Grant is for former foster youth. It's up to $5,000. And it's really just to help foster youth, give them a little extra help that they need to get through college. We've got institutional grants. That is so funny that I have the wrong bullets on here. I apologize for that. And it, it will be corrected. Institutional grants. These are things like um, an EOPS grant or if the college has additional money that they uh, can afford to give to students, it would fall under the in in institutional grants. And then we've got scholarships. Everyone knows what scholarships are. Um, and I also included in the handout, there are a list. I think there's about six or seven uh, scholarship websites that are kind of like scholarship search engines to help you with your scholarship search. And then private loans, which I talked about a little bit earlier. Those are the financial aid programs. I'm going to pause there to see if anybody has any questions about any of the programs that I talked about. Someone has their hand raised, Mariah. If you can unmute yourself, feel free to do so. Or if our host, if the meeting host can unmute her. Oh, here we go, here we go, I got it, I got it, I got it, let's see. So the question is, could you talk more about work study? Does that just mean you have a guaranteed job? And then how do you cash that in? So, okay, so the way work study works is, it's not a guaranteed job. And in most cases, colleges have more people interested in work study than they have work study dollars, right? So there's more demand than there is supply. So colleges generally have to come up with some sort of awarding priority criteria. And again, because we're such a huge system, 115 colleges, there's 115 ways that this is done, right? But in general, what happens is if you have enough unmet need, meaning you have financial need, then the financial aid office will make you a work study offer. They'll say, you know, it, it varies per campus. I've seen it at 1500, I've seen it all the way up to 5,000. But let's just say they give you a $1,500 work study award. In most cases, you're gonna need to take that award maybe to the career center or something on campus and apply for a job. If you get the job, then the, your employer knows whether it's in your a, a teacher's assistant, you're working in the financial aid office, the bookstore, the library, they're their employer and they know they'll connect directly to the financial aid office where they'll report your hours that you worked. And then you just get it, the financial aid office sends you a paycheck. 
Sometimes it again, it all depends on the college, but I've seen it. It's usually monthly. You just get your check monthly, you cash it, you spend it on whatever you need to spend it on. And then I hope that answers your question, but if not, let me know. And then we had another question. Um, is there a way to know if our Cal Grant A is on hold and will you be able to claim it once you get to the four-year university? Yes, there is definitely a way to determine if, you've, um, if your Cal Grant has been put on hold. It is done automatically though for you. But what you'll do is you'll go to the California Student Aid Commission, uh, California Student Aid Commission website, which is csac.ca.gov, which the link is in the handout. And you're gonna log into your web grants account. And then that way it'll give you a full picture and they've just revamped this. So it should, it should be pretty user-friendly. It'll give you the full picture of your Cal Grant award. So if you are on hold and also tell you how to claim it once you get to the university, again, that's pretty easy to do as well. So just make sure you check out the CSAC, um, the CSAC website. And then there was one more question. Can Cal Grant be on hold for more than two years? That's a good question. I think it can, but I'm gonna highlight that and I'm gonna see if I can find that real quick before we leave here. So let me make myself a note and I will figure and I will try to figure that out before we go, before we leave here. But that's a great question. Thank you. It looks like I got them all. So I'm gonna keep going. Okay. Let's talk about the applications. So we've got the FAFSA, which is the free application for federal student aid. And then we've got the CADA, the California Dream Act application. The FAFSA is for federal financial aid and state financial aid for US citizens or eligible non-citizens. And then the CADA or DREAM Act application is for our undocumented students with AB 540 status. And you can only access state financial aid only. That's the Cal Grant and then the Chancellor's Office financial aid programs. Okay. So when you're doing the application, this, this question, I've been in financial aid for about 20 years now. I worked in the financial aid office at Evergreen Valley College. I don't know if anybody are from over there, if, if you are, hey, how you doing? Um, and this is one of the biggest questions I get all the time is why do I need to put my parents' information on the FAFSA or the DREAM Act application? And there's just, I don't have the answer for you. It's just, that's just the way it is, right? Unfortunately. But this is, these questions here are how you're gonna know whether you're gonna use your income information or your parents' income information. So were you born before January 1, 1998? That's for the FAFSA for the 21-22. Basically, this question is asking, are you under 24 years old? If you are, right, that means you are still considered a dependent student, even if you do not live with your parents, and even if they do not give you a dime, right, you are still considered dependent until you're 24, or you can answer yes to any of these other questions. Are you married? Do you have children? Are you homeless or at risk of homelessness? And all those other questions. So if any one of those are yes, you get to use your own information. Another popular question about the FAFSA is the prior prior year income. So basically, if you're applying for financial aid, so like you applied for financial aid this year for the 2021 award year, you use the 1819 financial information on the FAFSA and the DREAM Act application. That was two years ago, so it's prior, prior year. A lot of people say, but two years ago, I was making way more money, or six months ago, my parents lost their job, or I lost my job, so what's, what's gonna happen? There's good news, right? Because there's that, that what if. What if, you know, like I said, I lost my job, and I don't make nowhere near as much money as I did prior, prior. Or for the dependency status, a lot of times it happens, you know, people, students will come in and say, I've lived with my grandmother my whole life. I don't even know my parents or my parents are incarcerated or my parents are living in some other country. I have absolutely no contact with them. I wouldn't even know how to contact them. There's good news because colleges have what's called professional judgment authority. 
basically what they can do when there are unusual situations or circumstances that could impact your eligibility, the financial aid administrator has the discretion on a case by case basis to change the information that you put on your FAFSA or DREAM Act application. So you do have to provide proof. Like for example, say like it's the case where you've lived with your grandmother your whole life, you've never know, known your parents, you would have to have your grandmother, a social worker, maybe someone from the church, another family member who knows your situation and can explain that to the financial aid director. Or in the case of your income changed, you would bring maybe a, a letter from unemployment, a letter from the employer that shows that you have reduced income, or perhaps you have you know, your tax returns, your most current tax returns that show that your income has changed. And so the point I wanna make here is that even if you don't think you're eligible, even if you say, oh, I made too much money two years ago, you know, even if, if you don't, regardless, you have to apply. Because even if that's your situation, if you don't do the FAFSA, there's no way for the financial aid director to know that you may need um, a dependency override or an EFC recalculation. Anybody have any questions going forward? Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna keep on going up. Oh, here we go. I do see a question. Let me pull it up. It's different while I'm sharing my screen. So, okay. So let's keep going. All right, let's see. Okay, so you apply for financial aid. What's next, right? What am I, what are you supposed to do? So this is a, a basic overview of the financial aid process. So um, you're gonna submit your application. You're either gonna submit it to the federal student aid, that's for the FAFSA, or you're gonna submit it to the California, um, excuse me, the California Student Aid Commission, that's the DREAM Act. Once you submit your application, either federal student aid or CSAC is gonna determine your expected family contribution. And what this is, it's an index to determine the type of financial aid and the amount for which you qualify. So we'll, so the EFC, again, it's not a real number, it's called expected family contribution, but it's more of an index. There's no direct line to say, oh, I made $20,000 last year. I'm, it's, I'm a family of one, what's my EFC? Unfortunately, it, it's not that simple. So, but just know that that's what happens when you submit your application. Next, each college that you listed on your application will receive your information. So it could be, San Diego State, UC San Diego, Sacramento State College, right? CSU Sacramento. They're all going to get your information and then they're all going to contact you to let you know, hey, look, we got your application, but we need you to do this. Sometimes students don't have to do anything else. The application is good. Other students, it, there may be a form missing. There may be, this, the college might need clarification on something that you answered on your application. And so that's where it's called file completion. You may be asked to submit your tax returns. You know, there's just all kinds of things. That's why it's super, super important. If you've got a financial aid portal um, or the financial aid office sends you emails, I don't know how they, comp they talk or communicate nowadays. Sometimes some financial aid offices use texting. Always wanna to respond to the financial aid office because they're contacting you because you need something to finish your financial aid file. Once you've turned everything in, financial aid office is happy, they've got everything they need from you, then your financial aid is awarded, right? You get the money, you can go to college, okay? I just wanna talk about the cost of attendance and the expected family contribution and uh, a, a, few, a few mechanics here. Basically, the cost of attendance is the average amount a full-time student can expect to spend while enrolled. It is also the maximum amount of financial aid a student can receive per year. So the cost of attendance is gonna include things like the enrollment fees, books and supplies, room and board, personal and miscellaneous, and transportation. Most community colleges will have at least two cost of attendance. They're gonna have one for students who live with their parents and one for students who live off campus. And you'll see, this is an example, this is an actual cost of attendance I borrowed from a school, I can't remember which school it was, 
But you'll see it's, it's very similar. The biggest difference is the room and board, right? The room and board here is where the difference is. And, and that makes sense, right? In most cases, it's gonna cost more to live off campus than it would to live with your parents. Now, this is the cost of attendance, but this doesn't necessarily mean that this is how much money you have to put out to go to college, right? The real one that you really only have to truly pay to the college are the enrollment fees. But if you're getting a fee waiver, that's taken care of for you. And if you're living on campus, many of our community colleges are bringing back on-campus housing. So if you're living on, on the on-campus housing, then you would pay that to the school. So again, this is just the average amount of full-time student can expect to have to spend while enrolled. So let's see. And then one other thing I mentioned that this is the maximum amount of financial aid you can receive per year. So let's say you're a student living with your parents and this is your college and they're saying 15,266 is the average amount it would cost over the year while going to college. If you get the Pell Grant, the, the Promise Grant, and you also get, let's say a Cal Grant and maybe a scholarship, all of that cannot exceed this $15,000. And your college will let you know they're going to send you an award letter and that award letter will list the cost of attendance. It's going to list everything that all the financial aid that you've been awarded and the amounts. And we'll also um, list on there something called unmet need. And what the unmet need is, that is the total cost of attendance, this, this number here, minus whatever financial aid you've received. One of the goals, um, and we're going to talk, I'll get to this in a moment too, is this financial aid reform where we're trying to address and trying to lower call, uh, students' unmet need because we're trying to remove that burden of going to college, that the whole burden of money. It's so stressful wondering how you're going to pay for college, how you're going to pay the rent, how you're going to pay, make your car payment while you're going to school. And so that's the whole idea behind um, financial aid reform but we'll get to that in just a moment as well. Okay, we're gonna move on. We're almost done here. Once you get your financial aid, right? You get your, you got your financial aid, you're good, you know, it's, it's going along, you're able to focus on your courses. Now the question is, how do you keep your financial aid, okay? You have to keep it. The whole point of financial aid is to help students get through college so that they can get a job and pay their taxes, right? That's a very simplified way of putting it, but that's one way of saying it. So in order to keep your financial aid, your college financial aid office is going to check your academic progress. So at each evaluation point, which is usually after each term, some colleges do it once per year, but most do it after each semester or quarter, they're checking to make sure that you've gained at least or earned at least a 2.0 GPA, that you have completed at least 67% of the courses that you signed up for and complete is a D or better, and that you are able to complete your program of study within 150% maximum time frame. Let's talk about that for a second. The maximum time frame is basically, so if you say an accounting major, right? You want to get your associate's degree in accounting. And that requires, a, it requires 60 units in order to get that degree. So what the financial aid office is looking at Tim, is to make sure that you have not taken more than 150% of the needed units. So 150% of 60 units is 90 units. Once you've hit 90 units, you're no longer gonna be eligible for financial aid. That's why it's super, that's why financial aid offices are making sure, and not just financial aid office, but every college, is making sure that students have up-to-date, relevant educational plans, because that ed plan is going to tell you exactly what you need, and it's going to be, the, for the accounting example, let's say, it's going to be those 60 units, and we all know, I think, whoever made the financial aid rules know life happens. Sometimes you have to drop a class or you get an F or some life gets in the way. And so that's why they give you those extra, that extra 50% in order to help you stay eligible for financial aid, but also again, taking into account that life happens. The SAP policies at each school varies. Some colleges 
don't require 2.0 until your second semester. Some require it right off the bat. So it's very important that you check out the satisfactory academic progress policy at your college. Colleges are required to have it on their website, so it should not be hard to find. Looking at the chat, do I have any questions? Cool, we're gonna keep on going. Yeah. So I kind of mentioned before financial aid reform. Financial aid, it's great, right? It helps so many students. As I talked about at the beginning, it was it's $3 billion to about a million student, community college students. So it's a lot of money, but it's, it's, it's not enough, one. Number two, it's very inequitable. Um, three, there are a lot of barriers to students getting financial aid and a lot of process barriers. Like I said, they're not hard, but they're just, it takes a lot of work to get past them. So that's where financial aid reform comes in, where it's to fix the inequitable programs, help decrease the amount of unmet need that students have and to remove those application barriers. One of the big changes in financial aid reform is actually Cal Grant reform. So Cal Grant, I don't, if you notice back on, let me go back up here real quick and I'll come on back. But if you look at the pie, this is federal grant. This little yellow sliver is all that California community college students get out of Cal Grant. Cal Grant is about almost $2 billion, okay, that is given out across the state. But only about 7% of that $2 billion comes to the community colleges, even though we have the lion's share of the student population, right? We've got 2 million students in the community colleges. And so I think that's why Cal Grant reform is such a big deal. If you wanted to look it up or if you wanted more information, you can go to look at Assembly Bill 1456 because it does talk about Cal Grant reform. Basically what it does is it's aligning state and federal eligibility criteria using that EFC, that expected family contribution as the index. For community college students, it's removing eligibility barriers based on age and time out of high school and GPA. I don't know if you remember what I said about the Cal Grant entitlement, transfer entitlement, you have to be under 28 years old in order to get that. And if Cal Grant reform passes, it removes that barrier. You know, and it will also create, like it says here, a more continuous, predictable eligibility that students will be able to know what they're going to be eligible for. And it really optimizes the current financial aid state, st uh, current, the state of current finance, the state of state financial aid. Sorry about that. It's it's Saturday afternoon now. All right. So Cal Grant reform, the program for community college students is called Cal Grant Two. Okay. Basically, all eligible zero EFC students attending a California community college will get a stipend. There's no GPA required. It eliminates the time out of high school and age requirements. And most importantly, it moves that deadline to September 2nd. There's no more March 2nd deadline. There would be no more March 2nd deadline. And the bottom line here is if Cal Grant 2 passes, it increases the student eligible under the current Cal Grant model from 124,000 students to 279,000 California community college students. It's not the best plan. Okay. And last year, before COVID-19, there was a more robust Cal Grant reform bill that was introduced, but the pandemic got in the way, the budget shortfall got in the way, everything got in the way. So the California Student Aid Commission was required to rethink their Cal Grant reform, knowing that they weren't going to have any new dollars. And so this is what they came up with. It's not ideal, right? But it is much, much better than the current system. If you want to learn more, the California Student Aid Commission has a really great, they have a slideshow that um, on their website, and then also AB 15, excuse me, 1456 is the, the assembly bill, if you want to learn more about it. Oh, one more slide, just to talk about the Cal Grant, Reform Cal Grant 2. It's just, it shows that, you know, 
this is a breakdown of how many more students or the types of students that will become eligible for a Cal grant at the community college. So we're looking at more lower income students, more first generation students, more older students, and more student parents will become eligible for Cal grant should the reform pass. There's also some FAFSA changes on the horizon. Some of these have already passed. And what they're gonna do is they're gonna make the FAFSA shorter. They're gonna rename that expected family contribution to the student aid index, which is in more alignment of what it actually is. It expands Pell Grant eligibility, and it also removes the lifetime um, direct subsidized loan limits. So basically the FAFSA currently, and this is the same for the DREAM Act application as well, it's about 108 questions, and that's going to be shrunk down to roughly 36. So that's going to reduce it like from six pages all the way down to two pages. The EFC will be renamed, like I mentioned, and it expands Pell Grant eligibility, um, which is really great because what's going to happen is incarcerated students could become eligible. Students who have drug related convictions in their past can be eligible. And students who, this doesn't really apply to the community colleges, but more so for the students who went to the private colleges that kind of closed. We're talking like the Western Career Colleges or some of those other schools that closed down. It provides relief for them if they're going to a school and then it shuts down. So that's the expanded Pell Grant eligibility. And I put a, a, a link in the handout to a really great um, article in Forbes magazine that talks about the expanded Pell Grant eligibility. And lastly, it removes the subsidized loan limits. Currently, you can only take, you can only borrow so much subsidized loans and it's gonna remove that all the way. Because currently, a student can only get a subsidized loan for 150% of the length of their program. So again, let's go back to that accounting major if your accounting major requires 60 units, you can receive a loan as long as you have not taken out, if, excuse me, as long as you have not attempted at least 90 units or 150% of that time required for the accounting degree. It's more information there. It's a little complicated. Most community college students aren't even close to this because many aren't taking out that many loans and because they're saving the loans for if and when they go to the university. Told you we covered a lot. So I've been talking for about, I don't know, it's been about half hour, 35 minutes or so. That's the last of my slides. I hope everyone had the opportunity to, um, to get that handout that I have. And if you don't, like I said, I, I'll send it to the student senate so they'll be able to have it and it will be available for you. Does anybody have any questions? I wanted to look up the Cal Grant for two years. Cal Grant. But does anybody else have any questions um, while I look that up real quick? Looks like you guys are going to get time. Um, looks like you're going to get time back today, which is always great for Saturday afternoon. So yes, yeah, so Cal Grant Awards are automatically placed into community college reserve for up to two years. But I believe if you contact um, the Student Aid Commission, they can extend it, but I'm not sure about that. And again, when I send the updated slides to the Student Senate, I'll make sure I include that question in there as well. So yes, and so there's a question about the PowerPoint. I might be able to drop it in the chat. Let's see if I can drop it in the chat. Let's, oh, but it's the wrong one. I don't want to put the wrong one on there because I left out. I'll just put it on there and then you guys will know. Don't use that one. But this is it. Let's make sure this is it. I don't want to give you the wrong thing here. No, this is it. So that's it. It's like I said, it's got the wrong. Well, I've sent it to someone privately. Let's see. Let's try that one more time. I had help today, but they called in sick. I guess the sun, it was too nice and sunny outside. They called in sick on me, so I'm here by myself. So but again, my name is Gina Brown. I'm on the Student Senate Executive Board meetings every month or most months. Um, so if there's any questions, feel free, feel free to, you know, if you walk away and, um, you know, something courtesy, oh, I should have asked, just send me an email and we'll get your, we'll get your questions answered for you. All right. 
So there's my email. I really appreciate you all being here. I hope you're having a really great General Assembly and learning lots of new stuff. But if there's no other questions, we're going to give you back about, what, about 20 minutes of your day back. So thank you, everyone.